Boy. Man, your pastor is awesome, and uh, he is, uh, uh, it is just great to be here with you. Uh, Heritage, I, uh, it's been about five years for, uh, for us, and it is uh, just great to see so many uh, familiar faces and see lots and lots of new faces. And so if I haven't met you before, uh, I'm just so excited to, to be here with you this morning and connect with you. And, and I did not do this in the other two on Wednesday night or the uh, previous service, but uh, I know that last night I was with uh, the Sunbergs and, and uh, Chad was trying to talk me into it. And so I'm going to do it just one time for Chad Sunberg. I just want to tell you, Heritage, I am so pumped to be here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it's just awesome. So, <laughs> uh, our family has definitely changed over the last five years. Uh, and I want to put up a little picture. There's my family, uh, Tracy and I, uh, and our little girl, Harper. And uh, everybody just say, ah. Uh, isn't she just the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen in your entire life? <laughs> and, uh, and so that's uh, Harper Abigail, and she... Uh, turns two on August 1st, and we are so excited uh, about that. And uh, that was us at Easter this last uh, spring, and it was a, a great time there. So in 2016, uh, my, my wife and I moved back to central Wisconsin, where I'm from, uh, to plant a church in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And I, am, uh, I grew up in that area. I'm uh, so excited about that. And I, I brought a few pictures with you just to see kind of what God has done over the last uh, four years. Uh, one of the things that we do every year, the first Sunday of November, which is uh, when we launched our church, we, um, we take a picture on the first Sunday of, every, uh, of November each year. Uh, so that when someday when we get to 100 years, right, and everybody's dead and gone and, um, with Jesus, that people can look back and say, wow, like it's a miracle that God works through that Weird looking group of people. All right, so here we go. This is year one, and uh, that was our first year. We were one year old there, and uh, that room, that picture was taken taken in one of the rooms at the Catholic convent, uh, which is where we planted a church. And so uh, we moved to Stevens Point, and uh, I'm Pentecostal to the core, and we planted a Pentecostal church in the Catholic convent. We was rolling with the sisters. Yeah, yeah. it was so fun. And so there, there we are at year two. Now that picture was taken in our current facility where we, uh, where we are. And uh, we, God opened up a miraculous way for us to purchase a building in year two. And so that's at 3017 Church Street uh, where we are there. And then go to year three. And we thought that, hey, we, everybody 100 years from now would want to look back and know what in the world happened in uh, 2020. So that's year three, all of us with our masks on and, uh, and uh, COVID hit. And, uh, and then go to year four. There we are just this last November uh, in year four at City Point Church. And God has been doing some awesome things. We're very excited about what the Lord has done over the last five years. This November will be five years for us. And I just want to say thank you uh, for supporting missions and uh, for being prayerful for us over the last five years and uh, believing in not only worldwide missions but local missions. And uh, this church supported us um, tremendously uh, as we got started planting City Point Church. And so it is just great to, um, great to be back here. And thank you so much for believing in missions. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, let's pray this morning as we get ready to dive into God's word. Uh, would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, I pray that over the next several moments in this place, that God, you would speak in a sovereign way. Pray, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate your word. And that God, you would speak uh, in the very real, very tender way that only you can. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. This morning... Uh, in our text, we are looking at the very end of Jesus' very famous 
Sermon on the Mount. Now, you don't have to have been around church or uh, around uh, following Christ very long to likely have heard or even heard references to this Sermon on the Mount. It's one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. It begins in Matthew chapter 5, verse 2, where it says, Jesus sat down on a mountainside. That's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount, okay, so just everybody caught that today. He began to teach this large crowd of people that had gathered on the mountainside along with him and his disciples. And so Jesus is out there, and uh, you know, it's not like these beautiful atmospheres that we have today with the lights and air conditioning. You know, they're out there on the side of a mountain sitting on a rock and, uh, you know, under the baking sun, and they're listening to Jesus preach, okay. Now, let me just say, uh, that if Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount, which happens, starts in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 5 and goes all the way through to the end of chapter 7. So three chapters of teaching that Jesus is giving to this large crowd that doesn't quite have the most comfortable environment to learn in. And Jesus, if, his, if this Sermon on the Mount went down the way that Matthew records it, this is literally like the most most ultimate sermon in all of history, okay? So, I mean, he talks about everything in these three chapters. He starts off by talking about evangelism, right? Because it's all about that one more. He starts talking about being salt and light. He talks about the law, because how many of you know you can't have a good Jewish sermon from a good Jewish rabbi if you don't talk about the law? And so he talks about the law. He talks about murder. I mean, come on. Any sermon on murder is going to be good. He talks about adultery. He talks about divorce. He talks about loving people. He talks about loving your enemies. He talks about uh, generosity. He talks about giving. He talks about prayer. He talks about fasting. I mean, are you guys catching this? He's going on and on. I mean, he is getting his preach on. And he talks, uh, he talks about worry. He talks about anxiety. And when you really think about it, Right, Like if it went down uh, the way Matthew describes, this is like a preaching marathon. Let me just paint a picture for you. It would be like if Pastor Heath got up one Sunday and uh, he said, all right, ushers, guard the doors. I hope everybody had a big breakfast this morning because we're going to be here for a while. And he just got into like, today I'm going to preach on everything. I'm going to hit every topic under the sun. You know, he goes into this crazy preach-a-thon, right? And finally, what happens in chapter 7 in our text this morning is that we get to the end of chapter 7 and Jesus is finally about to land the plane. And everybody's thinking, I've been sitting on this rock for hours. My butt fell asleep like three hours ago. Man, my crock, the, you know, the, the pot roast is burning in the crock pot at home. And they're like so excited that Jesus has finally gotten to the end. It's like he gets to that point where he calls the worship team up, he's setting up the altar call, he's just like, and everybody's taking this sigh of relief, right? Because Jesus has preached way too long. And we get to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And here's how Jesus closes the Sermon on the Mount. He says, therefore, everyone... Speaking to this crowd, after he just got done talking about murder, he's got done talking about adultery and divorce and loving your enemies and, and living for Jesus. And he gets through this whole sermon. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on a rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Now here it is. This is the next steps of the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' application to the Sermon on the Mount. He says, uh, you know, I know you guys do your, your next steps, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. This, this was Jesus' next steps in the Sermon on the Mount. And here's how the people 
responded in the end. In verse 28, it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their Jewish teachers of the law. Now, let me just say that I'm kind of like it, looking at this story and I, and I, I kind of put myself in the place of these people in the crowd that had just gotten done listening to all that Jesus had to say and just have gotten to the final uh, portion of his message. They've listened to the parable. They're in awe of what Jesus has said, but they're, they're probably likely thinking to themselves, oh, man, now I actually have to do something with what he just said. Right? Now I actually have to like go out and put into practice what I just heard. And, and I imagine this kind of moment, if you're, you know, like me, I imagine this kind of moment of panic of like, first of all, I have to remember what he just said. Now I know that, hey, nobody here has ever went home from church, had the pot roast, sat down in the lazy boy, woke up from your little nap and couldn't remember what your pastor preached on in the morning. Because you guys have such an awesome preacher. I mean, you just carry that, right? And, and so, so listen, but, 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 you know, they didn't, I mean, they didn't have Heath Beard, so they had Jesus. And, you know, Jesus, you know, <laughs> he, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> You know, they're like, well, I, first of all, I got to remember everything that Jesus said. And then, then I got to put into practice everything that Jesus said. Now, now, I want you to know Matthew is not the only gospel writer that records this parable. See, we also see an account of it in Luke's gospel. The parable in Luke's gospel also comes at the end of a lengthy teaching segment or a lengthy sermon uh, by Jesus. However, it's, it's, it's just not quite the preaching marathon that we see in Matthew, but it's still, pretty, it's still a pretty good chunk. But it comes at the end of a teaching segment in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 46. It's written a little bit different. I want to read it for you from the NLT, the New Living Translation. He says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? In other words... The problem was that there were people in Jesus' day who followed him around and listened to his words and even agreed with him and were like, man, you're so wise, you're so awesome. And yet Jesus scolded them and said, why do you guys keep coming over, following me and saying I'm your Lord, but you don't do what I say? Why, in other words, why is your walk different than your talk. And in verse 47, he says, I will show you what it is like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays a foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground with no foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. Man, somebody came here for good news this morning. And see, Jesus is giving, he gives us a couple of inevitabilities of life. He's basically saying there's a couple of things that you can absolutely take to the bank that I can absolutely guarantee you. And he gives us some inevitabilities of life here. He says, first is this. You need to understand that everyone is building a house. Everybody's building a house. Right? You see, your life is the house of the parable. And everybody is working at building a life. We're all building some kind of a life. The question is, what kind of life are we building? Everybody's building a house, right? And we know this because every day we get up and we grind in life to build a house. 
Many of us get up and we go to jobs, some of, some of them that we love and some of them that we don't love so much. We work for bosses that some of us love and some of us don't love so much. We go to work for, uh, for what? Because we're building a life. Right? We get up every day to go build a life. We get married trying to build a life. We buy and sell and build houses. We accumulate more and more stuff, all trying to build a life. See, everybody's building a life. Everybody's building a house. The second inevitability that Jesus gives us is that not only is everybody building a house, but the guarantee is that storms are going to come and they are going to beat against your house. That's just how life is, right? I mean, how many of you know that life can dish out some beatings? Man, life can dish out some major punishment at times. And, and it really, sometimes I think, man, it seems like the older I get, the more pain I have to endure. But it's not really that the older I get, the more pain I have to do endure. What it is, is it's teaching me that pain is always present in my life. Because it's inevitable. Storms come and beat against the house, right? About seven years ago, Tracy and I lost two foster kids uh, that we were trying to adopt. It was one of the most crushing, devastating, painful, tear-filled seasons of my life. And storms of life are inevitable. Things that come and bruise us and beat against our house are inevitable. And they may look different from person to person. They may even feel different from person to person. But suffering and, and pain and storms being present in our lives happens across the board. Jesus is saying that it is absolutely certain two things. Everybody's building a house. The question is, what kind of house are you building? And storms are going to come and they are going to beat against your house. And the truth of this picture that Jesus gives us is this, is that we are all builders of a life that will either be strong and enduring or it will be weak and destroyed. We are all builders of a life that will either be strong and enduring or weak and destroyed. Because Jesus is more concerned about our walk than he is about our talk. He wants us to do right not just say right. Your house, which represents your life, will withstand the storms of life that inevitably will come and beat against your house if you do what is right rather than just, rather than just talk about what is right. The difference is in how we build our lives. And so Jesus is getting at the core and he's saying, listen, everybody's building a house. How are you building your house? Are you building it on a strong foundation of rock or are you building it on sand? And see, the difference in how we build the, our house of life has to do with wisdom and foolishness. You ever heard that old saying? You know, when somebody like a, a kid or somebody's act, acting foolish, my, my grandfather who loved the Lord his whole life just went to be with Jesus at the ripe old age of 90 uh, back in January. And, and I'm excited that he made it to 90. He's got good genes. It means I'm going to make it to 100. And so, uh, you know, he went to be with Jesus. But he used to tell me when I was a kid and I was acting dumb because when I was a kid, I, I did a lot of dumb things. I acted dumb. And so when I was a kid and acting dumb, he would say, uh, he, he would say, you better wise up, young man. You better wise up, young man. In other words, he's saying, don't act like a fool. Wise up. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthian church talked about the difference between wisdom and foolishness. He said, where is the wise person of this day? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made the foolish, made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. 
But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So how does a person build a strong and enduring life? The people who build strong and enduring houses build them with wisdom. And see, Jesus' Jewish audience on the side of the mountain when he is delivering this message, they would have heard these words and they would have probably likely started to think about King Solomon, who many considered at the time and still consider today to be one of the wisest human beings to ever walk the face of the earth, right? And they would have began to think about the sayings of Proverbs. They They would have began to run through their minds, They might likely have thought about Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 where it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. They may very well have thought about Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 which says the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. And Jesus says here's the person who is wise. The person who is wise is not simply the person who hears my words. It's not even simply the person who agrees with my words. It's the person who does my words. It's interesting to me that it is both the wise and the foolish in the parable who hear the words of Jesus. They both hear the same teaching. They both hear the same words. But what is the difference? See, Jesus says the difference is in the person who doesn't just hear, doesn't just agree, and even isn't just in awe, but the person who puts into practice that which I've said. Jesus says the the difference is in the person who does what I say. My definition for you of, of wisdom this morning is this. Wisdom is living out the leading of the Lord in your life. Wisdom is living out the leading of the Lord in your life. It's following through on the words of Jesus. It's putting into practice the words of Jesus. The thing that's interesting about following Christ is that it's easy to talk about, it's harder to do. Because it's easy to talk about forgiveness But it is harder to forgive as Christ forgave. Right? It's easy to say, yeah, I know I should forgive. But it's really hard when the wound is still open to say, I can forgive. It's easy to talk about loving people until you have to love someone who is unlovable. Man, when we started our church four years ago, uh, it was kind of right in the very beginning, we were meeting in the convent, and uh, I remember the first day that he came, there was this guy, Frankie, and he was a homeless guy, he was a homeless drunk, period. And uh, he started coming to our church, and the first time I met him, I walked, he came in, he actually sat on a couch in the back of the room, and I could hear him snoring during the, the message, I went up to him afterwards and said, hey man, my name's Chris, what's your name? And he grabbed me and he, he squeezed me and picked me up. And, and I mean, I was, like, I was like in pain, like he broke my ribs or something. And he yells in my ears, he goes, my name's Frankenstein. And I'm like, Frankenstein, put me down. <laughs> and that began about four years of Frankie being a part of our church. And I'm going to tell you. It was hard. It was really hard to love that guy. Man, I had people who would come to me and they'd say, man, you got to do something about Frankie. We cannot, it's just chaos. He'd come in some Sundays, he would walk in in the middle of service. He'd be so drunk, he couldn't even hardly stand up. And he would walk in and there'd be like a new family, right? I'm going to tell you, when you're a church planner and a new family shows up, you're like, oh, dear, dear Jesus, hallelujah, get them. Right? We need people around here. And he would come in, and he would sit down right next to the new family. And I'd be thinking, oh. 
He'd throw his arm around him and be like, I'm Frankenstein. Oh, Randy. People would come to me and they'd say, man, you got to do something for Frank. We got to kick him out. We can't, ha- we can't have this here anymore. And I would tell them, I would say, man, I have to believe. I cannot stop believing that God could even get a hold of Frankie. Well, I'm going to tell you, he was really hard to like, love. He, he really challenged my patience. The last time I, I saw Frankie, I actually did have to kick him out that Sunday because he was, came in, he was too drunk, he was too, too belligerent. And I, in the middle of service, I just had to ask him, I said, hey, man, uh, you, you need to go today. And, uh, but I said, hey, I'm going to be around this week. Do you want to get a burger together? He said, sure. So he comes over on Wednesday, and I take him to the church, and I take him to South Point Restaurant. It's like this awesome greasy spoon right next to our church. And I take him next door, and we sit down for the next two hours. I had the first uh, breakthrough after four years with Frankie where he shared his story and talked about his life and his pain and his suffering. I shared the gospel with him. And I prayed with him, and then I, I, and then I left. We went our separate ways. But I had no idea that that actually was going to be the last time I would see Frankie. Because about a month later, uh, I got a call that Frankie was uh, drunk in the middle of the night, and he was stumbling through the streets, and he got hit by a car and killed. And uh, I did his memorial service. Um, and Frankie was really hard to love. And it's this idea that loving people, when Jesus says, Man, love your neighbor as yourself is really easy until your neighbor is unlovable. Right? It's easy to talk about unity until all you're surrounded by and bombarded by is division. It's easy to talk about reconciliation until you've been so deeply hurt by somebody. You say, I'm not going to reconcile. See, Jesus says those who build a strong and enduring life, they build it with wisdom. When the rubber meets the road, they do not simply hear the words of Jesus. They don't even simply agree with the words of Jesus, but they follow the words of Jesus. Solomon said the beginning of wisdom is this, to get wisdom. Though it costs you everything you have to gain understanding. Because the people who build strong and enduring houses build them with wisdom. But the people who build weak and destroyed houses... They build them with foolishness. See, people today, people today accept this uh, concept of individual autonomy, right? That truth has been relegated to whatever's true for you. It's this idea of personal truth. Because the possibility of absolute truth has been so widely rejected in the world, right? But here's the the problem with it. I I grew up, I'm I'm pastoring in in a college town. We we periodically have college students that come to our um, that come to our church and and uh, there are two uh, very dangerous prevalent heresies I believe in our world today, and the first is the rejection of absolute truth. The second is the idea of universalism that in the end Jesus will save everyone regardless of their belief, regardless of their faith, regardless of their life. And so I have a lot of people who come to me with this, uh, with these two kind of core beliefs in their faith, right? But, the, but we can't simply make up for the loss of absolute truth by creating our own truth. And here's why. We're simply wrong too often. I don't know about you, how many of you would say, man, you know what, I've been wrong before, Right? And if you're here this morning and you'd say, man, I've never been wrong, you're you're either young or you're single. (laughs) We're simply wrong too often. But see, Jesus concluded his sermon with a challenge about foundations. He said those who heard him were impressed by his authority, but amazement. Listen to this, amazement doesn't equal acceptance or submission. There are lots of people who will agree in theory that a house should be built on a solid foundation, but they may still go out and construct their lives in a swamp. Because here's the truth, 
is that you can hear the words of Jesus. You can agree with the words of Jesus. You can even be inspired by the words of Jesus. But until you're submitted to the words of Jesus, your life is not changed. The Proverbs says, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. You see, Jesus is ultimately making this point. That you can hear, you can agree, you can be inspired, you can even be in awe. But until you surrender, it's utter foolishness. Surrendering our lives to Christ means submitting ourselves under his lordship. It's the only way to build a wise life. There's so much foolishness in the world. There's so much foolishness in in the hearts of people today. But see, the idea is that Jesus is making the argument that until you surrender to the lordship of Christ, everything in our lives is utter foolishness. Surrendering our lives to Christ is the only way to build a wise life. And the Bible tragically says that the road of the foolish leads to destruction. That the foolish will perish but the wise will inherit eternal life. And see, I I am pastoring in church where, man, I face this this question a lot, that, that this idea that Jesus in the end will save everyone, regardless of their belief, regardless of their faith, regardless of how they live their life, regardless of their fruitfulness or lack of fruitfulness. And I've tell, I've t- I remember sitting down with a college student once where we were having this debate, and I, I said to them, I said, I would love nothing more than for that to be true. I would love it. It would be awesome. It would make my job so much easier if that were true. But I said, it's tragically not true. Because Jesus said, those who build foolish lives will crash into rubble. When the storms of life come, they will come down into rubble. The Bible tragically says that the, the road of the foolish leads to destruction. The foolish will perish, but the wise will inherit everlasting life. And you and I are builders of a life that will either be strong and enduring or it will be weak and destroyed. In James chapter 1, verse 22 says, do not merely listen to the word. He gives this warning. He says, and so deceive yourselves. There's so many people that are living deceived lives by just hearing the word and even being inspired by the word, but not being changed by the word. He says, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. They'll be blessed in what they do. Man, we're all building a life that will either be strong and enduring, founded on wisdom and obedience to Christ, or it will be weak and destroyed on the road of foolishness and disobedience. Would you bow your heads with me all across this place? I want to give an opportunity here this morning, very quickly, over the next moment, that if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, if I was honest with you, I have been building a foolish life. I've been building a life of foolishness and rejection of God and rejection of Christ in my life. Perhaps you're here this morning and you just sense a pulling on your heart. God is trying to get a hold of your life today. And the Bible says that we've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And that broke God's heart so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, bound in foolishness, that Christ died for us. 
The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. And all across this place, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I know I'm not right with God, but I want to surrender my life to Jesus this morning. You'd say, Pastor, if I was totally honest with you, if I was totally honest with you, I've even been inspired by the words of God, the words of Jesus. But I am not submitted to Christ in my life. But I want to be today. I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to pray for you. If you say, Pastor, that's me. On the count of three, would you just throw a hand up and put it right back down? One, two, three. Say, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. That's me. I'm going to pray. For those of you who raise your hands, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Prayer of surrender. And all of us who love the Lord in celebration this morning, we're going to pray with you. Let's pray together. Would you say it with me? Say, Jesus, thank you for your love. I surrender my life to you. I lay it all down. My hopes and my dreams, my sin and my hurt, I give you my life in submission to you. I ask, come into my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and my best friend. Amen. Would you uh, stand with me all across this place and take your connection card in your hand here this morning. On the back it says, next steps. And if you, if you prayed that prayer this morning of submission to Christ, it says, today I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ and prayed that I would walk in obedience to his word. Would you mark that on your connection card and drop that off so that uh, these incredible pastors can connect with you this week. And there's a couple next steps for you. Number two says, I will read and pray through Psalm 119 this week and ask the Lord to reveal his word to me in a new way. Psalm 119 is an incredible psalm. It's a long one. 176 verses in Psalm 119, so I broke it down into five days for you. Psalm 119, here's what Psalm 119 is all about. It is King David's value of the word of the Lord in his life. And as you read through Psalm 119 this week, would you pray that God would grow a deeper value for his word in your life? Number three is this, this week I will ask the Lord to reveal areas and ways that I have disobeyed his word. I will repent and ask the Lord to show me how to walk in obedience to his word. Number four is this week I will pray for the wisdom of the Lord in my life as I build my house. And then finally, this week I will write down what the Lord tells me to do. I'm gonna invite the prayer team to come we're going to open up the altars. And this morning, if you need prayer, like somebody to agree with you in prayer, and I invite you to come as we close this morning and receive, receive prayer this morning.